St Catherine's Dock, a stone's throw from London's Tower Bridge, is where the old world meets the new. 150 years ago, St Catherine's Dock was at the heart of Britain's trade with an expanding empire. In those days, ships from around the globe packed this basin to unload their cargoes of ivory, tea, dried fruit and indigo into warehouses newly built by prisoners from the Napoleonic Wars. But today, most of the boats in this basin are designed for pleasure rather than business. There are moorings here for over 200 yachts and there's also a maritime museum. And those warehouses are being converted into flats and shops and restaurants, all still in the style of the 19th century. However, the new St Catherine's Dock is much more than just a tourist attraction. This 29-acre development is the home of our World Trade Centre, designed to promote Britain's trade with the rest of the world. And over there in that building is our reason for being here this evening, the National Microprocessor and Electronics Centre. The microprocessor, better known as the silicon chip, a miniature computer in its own right. It can be used in as many different ways as you can imagine. Chips like those under the microscope are at the very centre of the new and thriving electronics industry. There are some 3,000 companies now working in the industry and this centre here is designed to give them a cheap and efficient way of showing off their products to potential customers. And this is a market that's growing more quickly than any other in the world. Experts say that the industry is growing so quickly, in fact, that every month between two and three hundred new products come onto the market. In the car industry alone, the use of microprocessors is increasing at the rate of 30% a year. And it's reckoned that by the end of the decade, the whole microelectronic industry will be turning over about £200 billion a year, making it second only to the car industry. And all of that adds up to a jackpot for someone. But whether Britain can share in that jackpot or not remains to be seen. Whatever happens to our manufacturing industry, the chip is here to stay and changing our lives in the most dramatic ways. Everything, in fact, from bark to boats. If, for example, you're in the fortunate position of owning a motor yacht like this one, you obviously need the best there is in navigational equipment. It's an expensive toy to put on the rocks. Well, this ship is called, appropriately, the Navigator. It's equipped with some of the most sophisticated navigational aids in the world, the sort of thing that Captain Cook would never have dreamt of. Cook found his way around the world by observing the sun and the stars. His only basic aids were the sextant, which gave him his latitude, and the all-important marine chronometer, which is basically a very, very accurate clock, giving him Greenwich Mean Time and therefore his longitude. And this system remained the state of the art for many, many years. The next important development was radio waves, but now we're in a new era, the era of satellite navigation. This is the latest in a long range of navigational aids made by Decker. It asks the satellite where we are. The satellite gives us our latitude and our longitude, and its simplicity itself, even for the layman, to translate that onto a chart and to give us our position here in St. Catherine's Dock by Tower Bridge. Now, these new systems using the microchip are important in two respects, accuracy and cost. They are so accurate that one ship can now get two fixes, one fix for the bow and the other for the stern. And in terms of cost, the impact is equally dramatic. A year or so ago, systems like this would have cost something like 10,000 pounds to install. Now you can do it for half the cost and other rather simpler systems are also being evolved for those of us who simply like mucking around in boats. Closer to reality for most of us are the differences which microtechnology will make to the way we work. There are telephones which will log all the people who phoned while you were out. There are weighing machines which will tell you exactly how much it will cost to send a package anywhere in the world in seconds. And the now fairly familiar word processors. This one's being developed in Britain with government money. And as you can see, the typist can not only correct a letter as she goes, but also she can transmit it at the touch of a button to almost anywhere in the world. And no more boring filing problems either, because this system stores its own file copy in its memory. And on the factory floor, things are changing pretty dramatically too because of the chip. Meet R2-D2 from Star Wars and his new film, The Empire Strikes Back. Hello, R2-D2. You may think robots like him are science fiction, but in fact, robots like him now are science fact. Bye-bye. Well, he's not as lovable looking as R2-D2, and he's certainly a lot bigger, and we had to do this outside because he's too big. 
But the point about HAL is, and you may have seen him on Nationwide before, he's the first British working robot, and he'll do anything you ask him to do. Once you've shown him once, he can repeat it over and over again. And of course, he's not fussy either. He'll do the dirtiest, most repetitive, most boring jobs on the factory floor without even asking for a tea break. And there's no harm in that, is there? Even in the home, the chip is already at work in cookers and washing machines. And the simple addition of a microprocessor to this sewing machine can make it perform up to 612 billion combinations of stitches. And if you wanted to try them all, it would take you like uh, 230 years to finish the job. The microchip is also going to give you access to more information than you're ever likely to need. This is the new post office system, and it's called Prestel. Now, let's just look at its application for the businessman. He needs a television set and a telephone. The two are linked together, and then through the telephone cable, he has access to a central computer. So from the comfort of his own armchair, he can instantly find out how his company is trading. Or if he's taking the day off and he's interested in racing and wants to catch up on who won the 2.30 at Cheltenham, then similarly, Prestel can tell him at the press of a button. And he can watch the racing too. But if you think this is all a bit much, a bit too like 1984, then don't worry, even computers, it seems, are human. This is the latest thing in microchips for the home. It's a pocket accountant, a bookkeeper, and a memory bank all rolled into one. I am a home computer. Are you, indeed? And a very colorful fellow you are, too. How are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. He has a computer that can talk. Admittedly, a rather limited vocabulary, only about 400 words at the moment, but it's building rapidly, as is this computer's capacity to do any one of thousands of tasks. It can help your children to learn to read, it can tell you how you're standing at the bank at the moment, and indeed whether or not you can afford the computer in the first place, and the cost around about a thousand pounds. Thank you very much. Any time by four now. Uh, uh, uh. The chip can even save you money on the road. This Jaguar is fitted with a special device which closely monitors how fast you're going and makes sure you use just the exact amount of petrol you need for the job. The chip used in this system was specially made for Lucas by a British company, Ferranti, and they reckon it could save you 15% on your fuel consumption. This Triumph Dolomite over here has a complete nervous system of its own, thanks to the microchip. It's been specially developed at the moment by Lucas, but it sensors throughout the car can tell you instantly what your speed is, your water temperature, oil, fuel, the press of a button, lights up here, your rev counters there, and if anything's about to go wrong, it can tell you that too. Dr. Shepard, we've seen there some of the applications of the microchip, but uh, what's it really going to do for our lives? I think it's going to change all of our lives, uh, in all of our environment. If you take the car, for example, there are some extremely fascinating systems now being developed uh, in cars. One's going to be able, for example, uh, within the next few years, to go onto a motorway system uh, and dial in the destination that you want to go to and display it in the car. Uh, will be directions uh, every time you come to a junction which way to turn uh, and these directions can take into account uh, all of the hazards uh, all of the traffic build-ups and so on to get you to your destination in as quick a time as possible. So we're going to have our own in-car navigation system? That's right uh, and this kind of thing has already started. In Germany one can see in one of the manufacturer's locations a test track where all these facilities can be demonstrated and it really is very fascinating and it's all going to be possible within the course of the next few years due to microelectronics. It all sounds so easy but are you absolutely convinced that the microchip is a force for good in society? Oh I'm sure it is. Yes, I think it's just one more stage in progress. It's faster progress than we've seen in the past, but I'm sure that it's a force for good because, like the Industrial Revolution, uh, that removed the, the need for brawn, as it were, uh, and replaced the muscular power by uh, machine power, 
Uh, here we've got a revolution that's coming along uh, and is helping us with, if you like, all the mental processes that we have to go to, uh, we have, that we have to go through, and is replacing many of those, helping us with many of those, uh, with electronics. I'm sure that it's a force for good, and I'm sure that it's going to produce goods and services very much more complex, very much more sophisticated and comprehensive, and I'm sure that everybody will want them. Yes, but at the end of the day, it does men out of jobs. There, there are those who argue that within 10 or 20 years we're going to see 5 million people permanently unemployed in this country. I think the truth of the matter is that it's a very difficult thing to predict. There are other people who say, for example, like A.D. Little in the States, they've done a survey on this and expect that within the next five years, 800,000 new jobs are going to be created in Europe due to microelectronics. Of course, there's going to be uh, new jobs on the one side, there are going to be jobs being replaced on the other. There's bound to be difficulty uh, in redeploying people uh, who've been put out of a job because of the changing pattern of industry. Nonetheless, I feel that very often the positive side isn't seen enough. That is the creation of new goods, new services and so on, which are going to employ new people. And if we are going to take part in that, then we've got to take advantage of the microelectronic revolution here in Britain. Dr Shepard, thank you very much.